Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Zeticon video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with NVIDIA. How many teraflops of computing performance would you like? Well, how about two petaflops with the HGX2? So we're going to be going through its specifications and performance. Then we're going to move over to ARM and the uh, Cortex-A76. This processor arm um, alleges will be able to keep up with the X86 for low power devices and it looks very promising indeed and of course is also their first native 64-bit CPU so we're going to be going into that in just a moment and then we're going to finish the video off with a bunch of new AMD uh, Ryzen SKUs including Ryzen 3 and uh, lower power Ryzen 7s, including the 2700E. So the HDX2 is not a computer in and of itself. Instead, it's the basis of a platform which others can then use to start to create their own systems. So what type of performance are we looking at here? Well, the system is insane. We are looking at 16 Tesla V100 GPUs, and those GPUs have a combined total amount of memory of half a terabyte. Just think of how much that actually is. So that the GPUs can communicate with one another, they leverage the NVLink, which means that each GPU can speak to another GPU on the system at 2.4 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which is absolutely bonkers. So, what can the 16 NVIDIA Tesla V100s actually achieve in the real world? Well, thanks to the 0.5 terabytes of memory and the 81,920 CUDA cores, or if you prefer, the 10,240 Tensor cores, an awful lot. That's right, 2,000 teraflops of compute performance, or if you prefer, 2 petaflops. And that is during AI, or 250 teraflops of FP32, or 125 teraflops of FP64. So how does this compare to previous generations and or other platforms? Well, 10 times faster in AI training. So the HDX1 would take 15 days compared to just one and a half days with the HDX2, which is absolutely bonkers. How does it compare to processors? Well, of course, it does depend on the task. But according to NVIDIA themselves, the HDX2 replaces 300 CPU servers for AI training and accelerates HPC 60 times faster than a CPU-only server, making it, quote, the strongest compute node for data centers. Furthermore, the HDX2 is multi-precision computing platform, allowing high-precision uh, calculations using FP64 or FP32 for scientific computing or simulations, while also enabling FP16 or INT8 for AI training and inference. This is unprecedented versatility and provides unique flexibility for su to support the future of computing. Ultimately speaking, yes, it can probably run crisis. The HDX2 was NVIDIA's big announcement at GTC, and of course, while many were certainly disappointed that we didn't hear about the new GeForce cards, but there is actually an update to that that I covered just yesterday, so you can go ahead and check that out, link will be in the video description. For folks who are interested in machine learning, artificial intelligence as a whole, or certainly any area where the HDX2 will boost performance, it is without a question going to be incredibly uh, beneficial for certain types of uh, computing environments. While many were disappointed we didn't hear news of the next generation GeForces at GTC, instead HGX2 turned out to be NVIDIA's main announcement. By the way, there is an update to the GeForce situation. You can go ahead and check out yesterday's video, which will be linked in the video description if you want more information on that. Without a question, for the areas which do benefit from HGX2 and its sheer computing performance, I suspect there are going to be many excited organizations. After all, the amount of performance on offer here is absolutely startling and it's quite unprecedented, particularly if you were to think back just a couple of years ago. There's a reason that Microsoft have been very interested in the ARM architecture when it comes to Microsoft Windows. And this is not going to change any. In fact, it's going to ramp up considerably more when you look at the Dynamic IQ second generation with the ARM A76. If you were to take a look at the traditional x86 processor with lower p uh, power devices, traditionally you're looking at single digit performance increases, which is nothing too impressive. Well, according to ARM themselves, 
So if we decide to take a look at the front end of the Cortex-A76, we can get an understanding of why um, ARM have managed to achieve such impressive gains. It is, at its heart, a super scalar out-of-order core, and there are numerous changes, as you would expect, compared to the previous generation. For a start, ARM have created a new predict-slash-fetch unit, and it's dubbing it the Predict Directed Fetch. This means that the branch prediction unit feeds directly from the instruction cache, and they have also added what they consider another industry first, the Hybrid Indirect Predictor. So the predictor itself is decoupled from the fetch unit. These two changes alone will allow for higher power consumption, uh, sorry, higher performance and lower power consumption, and because of the hybrid indirect predictor, it should also be easier to clock gate, which of course also will improve power efficiency. We also see the A76 with a wider design as well, with the decode and rename stages being bought to a four instructions per cycle compared to the two or three of the A73 or A75 respectively. The back end has also received a lot of tweaks and quite frankly there's too many for me to go over at depth in a news video but Key features include increased memory bandwidth, actually increased is the wrong word, massively increased memory bandwidth will probably be better. We see more than twice the performance compared to the Cortex-A75, as well as major changes to the vector execution pipelines. Floating point arithmetic operations have reduced in latency from three down to just two cycles, and multiply accumulate have gone down from five cycles to just four cycles. You'll also notice that it considers it has a 128-bit dual Ascendee design. And that's because with the A75 and prior, only one vector pipeline was capable of 128-bit. The other was only capable of 64-bit for the A76, and both vector pipelines are now 128-bit. In short, the A76 compared to both the A75 and the A73 is an absolute monumental leap forward. Comparing the integer performance with Geekbench scores of the A73 compared to the A76, you can see it's almost twice the performance. Floating, pipe, point, floating point performance excuse me, goes up two and a half times. And here we see the 35% improvement in performance for the total compared to the A75. Of course, the performance of these chips will come down a lot to form factor itself. And ARM do tell us that the A76 is meant to run at full frequencies in quad channel, um, excuse me, in quad core mode. But obviously, if it was in a slimmer design or something like a smartphone, it is possible or more likely that the clock speeds would indeed suffer, and thus, of course, performance as well. What is more impressive to me, though, is the fact that these processors will be 40% more efficient, assuming they're running at similar performance levels. Although ARM alleges because of this 7nm process, we will see the A76s run up to 3 GHz or even above. Given the market has moved on to so many different segments at the moment when it comes to mobile and uh, laptops, after all, if you do want that device which doesn't necessarily have huge amounts of performance but the battery does need to last, that doesn't necessarily mean you want the damn thing to be really slow. So perhaps with things such as always on devices, with Microsoft obviously really pushing at the moment with Windows 10, these CPUs could definitely find themselves at home. Now that Pinnacle Ridge has officially launched, AMD, of course, are doing their best to fill out the number of processors available in the lineup, and they are doing so slowly releasing additional SKUs. However, what is rather amusing is that a lot of these processors are being leaked ahead of official announcements by actual motherboard updates and or compatibility lists on motherboard vendors' websites. Enter ASRock, which have actually announced in quotation marks, four distinctive new Ryzen SKUs. We see the Ryzen 7 2700E, the Ryzen 5 2600E, and the Ryzen 5 2400X, and the Ryzen 3 20, uh, 300X. So what do these E numbers mean? Well, essentially they are energy efficient versions and cut down power consumption massively. For example, rather than 105 watts of the 2700X, we see it cut down to just 45 watts. Obviously, specifications such as clock speeds are lowered in kind, but even so. So what about the specifications of the 2700E and the 2600E? Well, as I mentioned, they operate at just 45 watts, which is considerably less than, let's say, the 105 of the 2700X, but 
Unfortunately, we don't know what speeds they turbo up to. However, the base clocks are some 900 megahertz slower with the 2700E compared to the 2700X. So 3.7 gigahertz compared to just 2.8 of the 2700E. The 2600E, however, does have a higher base uh, frequency, and that's obviously because it does have fewer cores. Although we still don't know the turbo frequency of this particular processor. We can also uh, tell that the rest of the specifications are identical. For example, instruction cache is still 64 kilobytes, data cache is 32 kilobytes, still 16 megabytes of level 3 cache, and so on and so on. We can also have a quick rundown of the Ryzen 3 20. 300x and the Ryzen 5 2500x. The 2500x is four cores, eight threads, obviously simultaneous multi-threading coming into play here, and has a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz, no word on turbo, but appears to still have 16 megabytes of level 3 cache. So we have a base clock here that's 100 megahertz faster than the 1500x, which is obviously its predecessor. The 2300x is four cores, four threads, so no SMT to be found there and it has 100 megahertz addition in its base clock compared to the 1300X. I suspect both the Ryzen 7 2700E and 2600E could be very interesting for folks who want to build a small form factor PC which is very quiet, but also has a decent level of performance. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Take care of yourselves and normal stuff if you've liked the video. Well, do feel free to click the like button and, of course, click the notification button. But with all of that said, have a great day. Bye for now.